Kylian Mbappe has never made it into the top three for the Ballon d'Or, mainly because he hasn't had the chance to be the club's sole focus, a player without any restrictions on actions, whom everyone plays for and ensures fantastic performance. After all, at PSG alongside Kylian, there has always been the more experienced and no less skillful Neymar, the superstar on whom they placed their bets a year before purchasing the highly promising Frenchman. The further it went, the more the situation irritated Mbappe. When last season began, Ney and his old friend Messi started carrying the French club and Mbappe found himself in the shadows. At that time, I guess, he regretted staying. Insider information about the Frenchman requesting or demanding Neymar's sale became the headlines in the news. And this summer, as soon as Neymar left, Mbappe immediately stopped conflicting with the management and even seemingly refused a huge bonus that he was entitled to if he continued playing for the club. The player returned to training. The life has improved. Now Kylian doesn't have to compete for the status of the club's main star. In case of a success, all the praises will be his. Let's recall other cases when top players felt discomfort and played below their potential simply because there were other stars in the team at that time. They had to adjust, yield their left position and receive the ball on certain occasions. Here are the top 10 star players who found themselves in the shadow of even brighter stars. David Silva, who has always been in the shadow of two legends, Xavi and Iniesta, opens up our top 10. David made his debut for Spain in 2006. He was used either as a winger or on the edge of a midfield, depending on the formation. In the Euro 2008, David scored two goals, but of course we remember the brain of Spain's attacks, Xavi. Xavi was included in the tournament's best 11 and finished fifth in the Ballon d'Or voting for 2008. Two years later, during the World Cup, Silva joins Manchester City. The Sheikh see him as the future of the club, but for the main coach of the Spanish national team, David is just a sub for the biggest tournament in football, although he played and scored in qualifiers and friendly games. Spain becomes the main team in South Africa, and the main star now is Iniesta with his winning goal in extra time of the final. Xavi also consistently performs well. He is once again included in the tournament's best 11. Both of them are in the top three of the 2010 Ballon d'Or voting. Silva's time to shine in the national team comes with a third consecutive tournament victory for Spain in the Euro 2012. David proves to Del Bosque that he deserves a place in the starting lineup and now consistently plays on the right side. The midfielder performs exceptionally well in the second game against Ireland, scoring four points. In the first round, Silva also provided an assist, a remarkable one. Spain advances from the group stage and reaches the final, where Silva scores an early goal that seals the fate of the match. But Iniesta is named the best player of the game despite not scoring any goals. David Silva is the best in the tournament when it comes to goals and assists combined. Xavi and Iniesta only have a few assists each in the Euro. However, Iniesta is recognized as the best player of the tournament, not Silva. And on top of that, David is not included in the list of nominees for the 2012 Ballon d'Or, while Xavi and Iniesta are once again in the top of the list. Spain is the dominant force in national team football in the late 2000s and early 10s. Iniesta and Xavi symbolize their attacking power, as well as being symbols of Barcelona, the main club of those years. Silva, on the other hand, was at Manchester City and Valencia, receiving less attention for this reason. Most importantly, David is the second highest assist provider and the fourth highest goal scorer in the history of the Spanish national team. He surpasses both Xavi and Iniesta on both lists. If David lacked something compared to Barcelona players, it was only a little talent, but he never became the symbol of the team. And he was never nominated for the Ballon d'Or in his entire career, even in the year when he was the best player of the Euro based on goals and assists. In that list, there are six Spaniards, even Busquets, who is not very noticeable, but not Silva. Just imagine how disappointed he must be. The place number nine is for Angel Di Maria, who is no stranger to the role of the shadow hero. He played this role at PSG and in the national team, where Messi is the boss. Oh, and just by the way, Angel scored and assisted in winning finals of the Olympics, Copa America and the World Cup. But we decided to highlight his time in Madrid, 
when the Argentini found himself in the shadow of another outstanding playmaker, Mesut Ozil. Judging by the performance stats, Di Maria was no worse than the German at Real Madrid. 190 games, 36 goals and 85 assists for the Argentini, while Ozil had 159 games, 27 goals and 81 assists. But most Real Madrid fans would answer the question who was better without hesitation. Di Maria was overshadowed by Ozil. They played together for three seasons and both arrived at the club in the same transfer window in the summer of 2010. Ozil was signed for 18 million from Werder Bremen and Di Maria for 33 from Benfica. It was a controversial decision to sign two rising stars with similar roles, but it marked the beginning of the second period of Paris' time at the club, characterized by Galacticos' transfer policy. In the 10-11 season, Di Maria often played as a right winger, but Ozil also appeared in that position, although his main role was an attacking midfielder. Funny enough, Misut made his La Liga debut as a sub for Di Maria. However, Ozil surpassed the Argentini in their main performance in Decatur in the very first season. With 28 assists in club competitions, Ozil became the best playmaker in Europe, surpassing even Messi. In the Champions League, Ozil contributed one goal and seven assists, while Di Maria had three goals and three assists. The following year, Ozil was the best assistant in the top five European leagues. Di Maria was also in the top, but the praises go to the one who is the first. In the 12-13 season, Ozil got 10 goals and 25 assists, while Di Maria's numbers were also good but more modest, 9 goals and 16 assists. Mesut was included in the UEFA Team of the Year for two consecutive years, while Angel didn't have any official individual achievements while playing at Madrid with Ozil. But as soon as Madrid sold the German, Di Maria had a superb season, 11 goals and 26 assists in all competition, including an assist for the winning goal in the final of the Champions League, he was named the man of the match. Di Maria made it into the top 10 of the 2014 Ballon d'Or, even though he hadn't even been nominated in the previous three seasons while well, Ozil was. After the departure of his competing playmaker, Di Maria no longer just became one of the wingers, he played a lot in the midfielder position. It was the only season without Ozil that Di Maria became the star playmaker of the stellar club. Eighth place is for David Beckham at Real Madrid. He was the third mega star bought for the Galacticos project after Luis Figo and Zinedine Zidane. In the end, he ended up in their shadows. Zidane was just the undisputed leader of the team after his performance in the 2002 Champions League final. And in the late 90s, early 2000s, Figo was the most dangerous man in the world on the right wing. And that's why Real Madrid went for the scandalous deal to lure him from Barcelona. In the year of 2000, the Portuguese player won the Ballon d'Or, and in 2003, when Beckham arrived in Madrid, Figo was still on top. With 8 plus 11 in La Liga and 2 plus 4 in the Champions League, he was unstoppable. Real Madrid's coach at the time, Carlos Cuerres, tried to move Figo to the left wing in the first few games to use Beckham on his natural position on the right, but he quickly abandoned those experiments because they were detrimental to the team. As soon as the coach returned Figo to his original position, they destroyed their opponents and Luis scored two goals. David must move deeper into the midfield. From there, he also influenced the game, but with fewer contributions. At the end of that season, the world-famous football pop star Beckham didn't receive a single vote for the Ballon d'Or. Although a year earlier, he was in the top 10 and previously ranked second and fourth. In his second season in Madrid, Figo became the team's top assistant in the Champions League alongside scoring four goals. And the Englishman continued to play closer to the center of the field, scoring four plus eight in the championship and making only two assists in the Champions League. But 11 yellow cards in the championship were Beckham's personal anti-record at the time. Well, it wasn't his job to chase after opponents and try to take the ball away in the middle of the field. David was still included in the list of Ballon d'Or nominees, but no one voted for him again. Meanwhile, the already not-so-young Zidane, playing above David either in the center or on the left, remained in the spotlight. He was included in the FIFA Pro Best 11 of 2005 and in then 2006. In the 05-06 season, when Beckham set a new personal anti record for yellow cards, 14 this time in the Liga, Zidane played like in his best years, 9 plus 11 in the championship, in excellent form for the World Cup, and at the end of the year, he made it into the top 5 of the Ballon d'Or. Even after Figo and Zidane left, Beckham didn't become the main star at Real Madrid. What can we say, even if his favorite number 7 was taken away because it belonged to club legend Raul? 
it's probably hard to be a global star and realize that you're playing second fiddle in the club. Seventh place belongs to Olivier Giroud, the striker who was always in the shadow of others in the national team, even though he scored more goals than anyone in the history of the Blue. What a paradox! Let's make a list of those who overshadowed Giroud with their bright play. Olivier debuted for the national team when Real Madrid player Benzema was already established there. Giroud came off the bench for a long time and he played his first 90 minutes only a year after his debut. At the Euro 2012, France played with only one striker, Benzema. Giroud came on as a sub three times in the closing stages but didn't score any points. At the 2014 World Cup, Duchamp tried to fit Giroud into the team, the top scorer of Arsenal that season. In the second round of the tournament, the coach put the versatile Benzema on the left and put Giroud up front, and he got a goal and an assist. But the experiment was not successful in the long run, Giroud stopped being a starter. The Euro 2006 was supposed to be Giroud's shining hour as Benzema was excluded from the national team due to a criminal scandal. Giroud started once, scoring once in the group stage, and excelled in the first two knockout games. He even got 2 plus 1 against Iceland in the quarterfinals. But France lost to Portugal in extra time in the final, and only Payet and Griezmann from the team made it into the UEFA's best 11. After the Euro 2006, Giroud said he was annoyed by the whistles from French fans who missed Benzema. Such obstructions happened regularly. Imagine Giroud was in Benzema's shadow even when he wasn't allowed near the national team. Moving on to the victorious World Cup in Russia. Benzema is still out of the team, but now Mbappe has appeared. He is now the brightest player in attack and Giroud is burdened with rough work to distract defenders and help his partners. Olivier copes with this functionality perfectly, the team works like a single mechanism and takes the gold medal. But everyone praises Mbappe and Griezmann, while Giroud is criticized. Many don't care what task Giroud had from the coach, he didn't score a single goal throughout the tournament and that's the main thing, no one remembers Giroud. At the Euro 2020, Benzema returns to the team, and Giroud, on default, loses his place in the starting lineup. He only came on twice as a sub, while Benzema scored two braces. Everyone admires Karim's play, especially his spectacular handling, which allowed him to score one of the two goals against Switzerland. And the culmination of Giroud's attempts to become the main man in Le Bleu, the World Cup in Qatar. Giroud is a veteran who has just helped Milan return to the top of Italian football, and his mood is soaring, and Benzema is injured, meaning there will be plenty of playing time, a brace in the very first game, then important goals in the round of 16 and quarterfinals. He could even compete with Mbappe for the title of the top scorer, but Kylian scores a hat-trick in the final and becomes the tournament's top scorer. And Griezmann had a huge impact on the attack, revealing himself anew and becoming one of the main wonders of the tournament, and Giroud was shamefully sobbed at halftime of the final after a failed first half. He won't be remembered again when people recall the main heroes of the national teams at big tournaments. Sixth place goes to Adin Dzeko, who couldn't shine at Manchester City. He was bought as a ready-made star for 37 million from Wolfsburg which was a record outgoing transfer at the time for the German club. He arrived in the winter transfer window when he was on his standard goal-scoring schedule in the Bundesliga, aiming to score 20 goals for the third year in a row. However, at City, he had to compete with Sergio Aguero and Carlos Tevez, among others, but will focus on the really big players. Tevez was already in the team when Jacko arrived. Roberto Mancini logically played the giant Bosnian with the diminutive Argentini. But while Edin only scored twice in the second half of that season, Tavis was putting in some very impressive numbers. In Jacko's debut Premier League game, Tavis scored a brace, seemingly showing the newcomer who the boss is. And when Mancini decided to play with only one striker in the 26th round, leaving Jacko on the bench, Carlos scored the hat trick. The same story repeated in the 37th match day. Tavis started, Jacko came on as a sub, Carlos scored two points, Edin was disappointing. In the summer, Manchester City bought Sergio Aguero, who would become the club's all-time top scorer. The £40 million setting immediately got to work and became an easy choice for the striker position. But most importantly, it was Aguero who brought City their long-awaited first championship in 44 years. 
However, it was Jacko who started the comeback for City in the legendary last game against Queen's Park Rangers. If it weren't for his goal after a corner kick, in the 92nd minute, there wouldn't have been Aguero's star moment and the championship parade. Few people remember this detail, except for diehard City and Premier League fans. That match and the final round in general are associated with Aguero's goal, Mancini's run and even Ferguson's red face from the parallel game, but now with Jacko's crucial goal. I feel sorry for Eddie because his Queen's Park Rangers goal tends to be forgotten compared to Sergio's winner, confirmed former City director Brian Merwood. Jacko stayed at City longer than Mancini, with whom he had some rough relations, but he couldn't become a star there either, that's why I wasn't always happy, you know? But with so much quality in the team, that's the battle you always have to face. We had Sergio, Tavis, at different times there was Jovic, Balotelli, Negredo, Adebayor, Boni. So many strikers were at the club in that period. In the end, Jacko had great stats at City, 110 goal involvements in 189 games, even though he often didn't play full games. He's in the top 10 of City's all-time top scorers, but he still wasn't appreciated, and he's not considered a City legend today. In 2015, Edin left for Roma, and only there did he remember what it's like to be the team's top scorer and make it into the teams of the best. Fifth place goes to Roberto Firmino, the 11th top scorer and 7th top assistant in Liverpool's history. He's highly respected by the fans, but when it comes to the team's attack, which won both the Premier League and Champions League after a long drought, the focus is primarily on Mo Salah and Sadio Mane. Bobby is in their shadow. Fun fact, before joining Liverpool, Firmino was the top scorer at Hoffenheim. He was called the breakthrough of the Bundesliga season. At Liverpool, Bobby became a standard forward who performs a huge amount of defensive work and supports the main stars of the attack. Even before the arrival of Mane and Salah, the Brazilian didn't top the club's scoring list. He was outscored by direct competitor Starridge and winger Coutinho. In his second year at the club, Firmino surpassed Mane and Coutinho in goals. By that time, Klopp had found the optimal role for the Brazilian center forward. He became a false nine, taking on a large amount of pressing work which he handled brilliantly. No wonder he was called the world's first defensive striker. But this is cool for geeks, but the wider audience has its own heroes. Mane made it into the team of the 16-17 Premier League season, and even Liverpool fans and players named him the best player. Before the start of the next season, Klopp has signed another star winger, Salah. Firmino gave up his number 11 to the Egyptian, and this is a very significant moment. Mo, like Sadio, immediately took off. He became the top scorer in the Premier League and finished sixth in the 2018 Ballon d'Or voting. In the 1890 season, when Liverpool won the Champions League, Bobby held with goals, but he didn't play in the epic semi final against Barcelona when his replacement Origi scored twice and didn't score in the final, where he was replaced in the 60th minute by the same Origi who scored again. The lucky benchwarmer is more associated with the title than the extremely useful Firmino. According to the 2019 Ballon d'Or voting, three Liverpool players made it into the top five, but Firmino wasn't among them. He had an honorable 17th place. I will end this slightly sad story with Klopp's beautiful quote. Mo Salah, world class, but not everyday. Sadio Mane, world class, but not everyday. Roberto Firmino, world class, pretty much everyday. Let these words be a comfort for Bobby, who spent seven years, the greater and better part of his career, in the shadow of more star partners, doing a lot of work for them. And he didn't complain about it, by the way. In fourth place, we have the well-known story of the battle between Cavani and Ibra at PSG. Let's look at it from the angle of the topic we are exploring today. So Zlatan was bought first in 2012 for 21 million, and in the summer of 2013, the Sheikh suddenly paid a very solid sum, 65 million, for another striker, 26-year-old Cavani. It was then the sixth most expensive transfer in the football history, but what's the point? Well, when money is not a problem, why not take another cool attacking player and then let the coach figure out how to use him? So that time, PSG coach Laurent Blanc got a new striker in addition to Zlatan, who was in top form 
who hadn't played a single game in any alternative position at his previous club, sharing game time between two superstars. It even sounds crazy, and fitting them both on the field is a tactical puzzle and a bold experiment. Blum began to think, the option with two of them up front didn't inspire the coach, and starting from the third round, the Uruguayan was retrained as a winger. Cavani scored and even sometimes assisted, but this efficiency significantly decreased compared to the last season in Italy. Meanwhile, Ibrahimovic continued to load the opponent's net. Addison couldn't avoid such questions from journalists, is it okay for you to adjust to Zlatan? The Uruguayan answered as politely as possible, a quote from the beginning of the second season of Cavani at PSG. No problem, we complement each other with Zlatan. He distracts defenders to give me more space. Yeah, right. Next season, Zlatan scored 50 goals in all competitions, adding 20 assists to them. Cavani had 25 plus 6, which looks more than modest against the Swedes' numbers, although there is no big difference in playing time. We get a comprehensive explanation of what is happening when after three joint seasons with Cavani, Ibrahimovic goes to Man United. Addison immediately matches Zlatan's goal numbers, 49 in the 16-17 season, he acts strictly in his native position, no more experiments, and proves that as a striker, as a scorer, whom the team plays for, he is no worse than Zlatan. After Ibra, Cavani twice became the top scorer in League One, received the Player of the Year award, almost made it into the top 10 in the Golden Ball voting. In April 2018, Edison surpassed Zlatan on the list of PSG's top scorers of all time. He proved everything to everyone, and you know, it's even a little sad that the Uruguayan tried unsuccessfully for three years to get out of Zlatan's shadow in Paris. If he were in another big team, without an equivalent competitor, his legacy in European football could have been much bigger. In third place, we have two stars who've shown not as brightly as Messi in Barcelona. You already guessed, we are talking about Neymar and Antoine Griezmann. To be more precise, Neymar in 2017 approached Messi's numbers for goals and assists, and in some important games, he began to show himself as the main man in MSN. In his last season in Barcelona, the greatest comeback, called Remontada, was organized by Neymar, and Leo only scored one goal in the game, converting a penalty earned by Neymar. However, no matter what Ney did in his last years in Barcelona, it was Messi who remained the symbol of the team and the main contender for the Ballon d'Or, alongside Ronaldo. The Brazilian was furious and he eventually agreed to PSG's offer. In reality, his move was more of a whim than a plain necessity. He was really integrated into the team and was its star, but he wanted more. Although he managed to make it into the top three of the Ballon d'Or rankings based on his seasons in the jersey of the Spanish club, if we play with words that in Paris, Neymar was already a shadow of himself from his late Barcelona period. As for Griezmann, he had to leave Barcelona because his career was falling apart. Well, if we take into account that Antoine is not just a good player, but twice officially the third best in the world, it makes sense. Explaining his initial refusal to move to the capital of Catalonia, Antoine admitted, it was very difficult to refuse the transfer to Barca. But on the other hand, I had a club where the game was built around me where I'm considered an important player, perhaps on the subconscious level. The desire not to be Messi's lieutenant played a role. Griezmann couldn't resist the temptation and fell into the trap he knew about in advance. He was used in five positions in Catalonia, that is, all the positions on the attacking group were tried. Thanks to this, the Frenchman had no problems with playing time, but he inevitably had to adjust to Messi, as well as work back for Leo, who, as we know, is exempt from any dirty work. In the more attacking Barcelona, the Frenchman had fewer scoring opportunities than in his last two seasons in defensive Atletico, although he played mostly as a center forward 40 games and on the wings 50 games. The decrease in expected goals is a direct consequence of playing in the same team as Messi, who must be the main scorer and recipient of passes by definition. What's more, there was an insider information that Leo wasn't happy with Griezmann's arrival because he initially ditched Barca. And therefore, there was no great motivation to pass to the Frenchman, highlight his strong qualities alongside Messi. As a result, the Frenchman's two year stay in Barcelona didn't lead to anything good. The 90 minutes recognized his transfer as the worst in football history. After Antoine corrected the main mistake of his career, getting out of Messi's shadow by leaving the Barcelona project, 
he revived his career and became one of the best in the world again, regardless of age. In second place, we have Karim Benzema in the shadow of Cristiano Ronaldo. These two joined Real Madrid in the same transfer window. Benzema was a star at the national level, while Ronaldo was a planetary star, which was reflected in the difference in their transfer fees. Ronaldo started scoring right away, playing as a winger. Meanwhile, under Pellegrini, Benzema was first paired with Raul, then with Higuain, and then again with Raul. In the fourth round, Karim, who had only scored once at the start of the championship, was benched. In his debut season, Benzema played only 1300 minutes in the Liga, scoring 8 goals and providing 5 assists. Later on, Karim played and scored more, but good seasons in terms of stats were mixed with fairly average ones. Although coaches at Madrid appreciated his versatility and work ethic, especially Ancelotti, who made Karim an important element of his playing system from his first arrival, fans who were not experienced in tactics gradually began to hate the Frenchman. Meanwhile, Benzema worked so hard on the field that he often didn't have the power to finish attacks. Therefore, his finishing was sometimes lacking. In the 17-18 season, Karim scored 9 goals less than his ex model predicted. Here are 10 most common words about Karim at the time. Benzema is overhyped, dependent, uninspired, slow, worse than all his counterparts, and scores very few goals. That was the audience's perception. Meanwhile, there could be no complaints about Ronaldo. He scored more goals per game on average, led trophy campaigns, won Ballon d'Ors and Golden Boots, and glorified the club not only in football short, but also in a tuxedo. However, the most attentive fans didn't miss Ancelotti's statement in 2015. I think that Ronaldo's success is largely down to Benzema's hard work. The Frenchman later himself talked about how he worked for Ronaldo, accepting to be in his shadow. It's true that I've scored many more goals, but when Cristiano was here, we had a different style of play. I was providing more assists. He really helped me on and off the pitch. We saw Benzema in a new role in the very first year after Ronaldo's left. Four out of five seasons without Cristiano, Karim in Madrid scored 30 goals per season. Although previously, in nine seasons, he had only done it once. And we fully enjoyed the new Benzema in the 21-22 season, when the Frenchman became the top scorer in the Liga and the Champions League for the first time in his career. In the Champions League playoffs, he equaled Ronaldo's record of 10 goals and in total, he scored 15 goals in 12 games in the tournament. It was phenomenal. In the same team with Cristiano, Karim would have never caught such inspiration. He would have worked instead of flying around the field, and he wouldn't have allowed himself to rely on his luck so often and wouldn't have scored several amazing goals because of it. And, of course, he wouldn't have won his first Ballon d'Or at the age of 34 in 2022. To get out of Cristiano's shadow, Karim had to play for Real Madrid for five more seasons, and it was worth it. And in first place, we have Paulo Dybala, who managed to be in the shadows of both Messi and Ronaldo. It's a flash royale, you could say. First, let's briefly talk about the national team. It's all clear here. Dybala is too similar to Messi to be considered a starting player, rather than a substitute. 38 games in total, noticed 3 plus 7, and as we saw at the World Cup in Qatar, Dybala has resigned himself to his role as a sub. Getting out of the shadow of the best player in history, especially if you're similar to him in functionality, is an unsolvable task. As for playing with Ronaldo, this is more interesting because Paolo and Cristiano are more diverse, but the age difference seemed to leave the Argentini with some hope. However, we are getting ahead of ourselves. Let's go back to the beginning of Dybala's career in Turin. In 2015, Paolo moved to Juventus as the best assistant in Serie A. A 22-year-old rising star was signed for 41 million. Dybala was given Pirlo's number, who left that summer. They saw a future creative leader in the Argentini, a future brain of the team. Paolo, in general, lived up to expectations. Three appearances in the Serie A team of the season, European Media Team of the Year, the top scorer in Coppa Italia. In the 17-18 season, Dybala even became Juve's top scorer, 22 goals in Serie A. The best result on the team, which had such center forwards as Iguain and Mandzukic. Wow. But in the summer of 2018, Juventus signs Cristiano for record money. 
and the Balas fairy tale in touring comes to an end. He is still a starting player, but everyone passes the ball to Ronaldo. He eats up space, takes a lot on himself, and doesn't notice the talented Argentini. 5 plus 2 for Paula in the championship in the first season with Cristiano, very little. Allegra uses Dybala in 4 positions, but it's more like attempts to fit the player into the starting lineup. Actually, Cristiano himself constantly and it seems sincerely tried to support his younger partner in every way, and with words and even celebrated a goal in the Argentinian's style. Journalists claim that Ronaldo saw a friend in Paulo, but does that matter? In professional sports, sentiments ultimately take a back seat. Every top athlete needs a personal throne. Sarri made several attempts to combine Ronaldo and Dybala. He more or less succeeded, but the team lost structure and Sarri was fired. Pirlo has already started pushing the Argentini to the bench. It all ended up with Paolo failing to reach an agreement with Juventus management on extending his contract, although Ronaldo had already left by then. But after several weak seasons under Ronaldo, Paolo was no longer highly valued. And what would have happened if in 2018 Dybala hadn't been knocked down at the peak of his career by the board's decision to bet on the star Portuguese veteran. Maybe Dybala would now be one of the best players in the world. Honestly, it was only during the preparation of this video that I realized what a dramatic fate Dybala has. It's unlucky both at the decisive moment of his club and his national team career to be in the shadows of two of the greatest players of modern times and possibly the eternity. That's what they call, if it didn't work out, it didn't work out. That is all for today's video, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video as much as I did. As usual, don't forget to hit the like button, leave a comment and subscribe. See you next week. Know the ball.